Hi, I'm Philip Anthony Elbertelli, and welcome to The Weekend Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever. And this is episode 7, Atheism and the Transcendent. I know when I first set out to do this podcast, part of my mission statement was I was not only going to wax philosophical about my religious beliefs or lack thereof, but I was also going to cover uh, current event stories that had to do with religion or atheism. And I think it's been at least a couple of episodes since I've done that. So before we dig into the main topic of today's episode, I guess I'll stop and do a quick news story. It's a fun little story. Well, maybe not so fun if you're Mel Gibson. Uh, Not to imply that Mel Gibson might somehow hear this podcast. That would be beyond grandiose. I'm still in my own little dark corner of the internet trying to fight my way towards recognition. That's why it's important to like us on Facebook or to rate us on iTunes or Podbean. But anyway, and please forgive me if my voice sounds extra froggy and uh, low and droning today. I was out last night trying to talk above heavy metal music all night, so um, but I think I have enough of a voice left to do this episode. I'll soldier on. So this story first came to my attention via the Huffington Post, and it seems that Mel Gibson and screenwriter slash director Joe Esterhaus, or Esterhaus, I don't, I don't know, hope I'm not butchering his name too badly, um, are locked in some kind of rather ugly feud. And the source of the feud uh, goes back quite a ways. You're probably all familiar with the very controversial Mel Gibson film, The Passion of the Christ, uh, that came out some years ago. The movie came under critical fire, um, not just uh, because of what some people saw as anti-Semitic elements in the film, but also because of the hyper-violent nature of of the movie as well. Unlike previous movies about the life of Christ, one of the things that was unique about Gibson's film is that mostly focused on the scourging and the crucifixion, making for a somewhat, well, not somewhat, a, a very gory film. Not that that's necessarily bad in and of itself. I actually had mixed feelings about the Passion of the Christ. On the one hand, um, I did find the level of gore and violence and the overall dark tone of the film uh, rather strange for what should be an uplifting uh, religious movie. Uh, but the tale of the, scour- of the scourging and the crucifixion is inherently um, morbid in a sense. But I suppose what makes it uplifting is the, uh, the resurrection that punctuates it. I did like the extra lengths that Gibson went to to add authenticity to to the film. I know some people hate foreign films, some people hate subtitles. I don't really um, mind them. Uh, In fact, I loved how the movie was in Aramaic, and um, I think there's also touches of Latin and Greek as well. And I actually thought that Jim Caviezel's portrayal of uh, Christ, um, especially with the addition of uh, the, the makeup and whatnot, resulted in probably what was one of the most Semitic looking um, portrayals of Jesus we've ever seen on the screen. As far as the allegations of anti Semitism go, I was kind of uh, at a loss to make a final judgment on that count. Because on the one hand, uh, anyone who knows your basic facts about uh, Christianity and its origins know that it is essentially a Jewish religion. Jesus and all his initial followers would have been Jewish. It wouldn't be until after his death when you had the Jesus movement uh, 
gathering steam, if you will, through the classical world that you would start to have uh, non-Jewish converts. So, I mean, Jesus, his mother, his followers, um, the high priests, uh, I think... I didn't see anything that was specifically or jumped really out at me as being anti-Semitic. I know that some people claim that the sympathetic kind of proto-Christian figures, if you will, like uh, Jesus, his followers, his mother, Mary Magdalene, um, they were shown as being more attractive than the bad guys of the film. The... Um, the majority of the high priests and the throngs that were calling out for Jesus's blood. <laughs> um, th there were accusations that the, uh, that maybe Gibson went out of his way to make those less sympathetic figures uh, fit more of the, um, that negative Jewish stereotype that you kind of see from those awful Nazi propaganda posters, propaganda posters from World War II. I wasn't really, uh, I wasn't really sure if I agree with that or not. I'm just not sure. Uh, in fact, I know the actress who played um, Mary Magdalene, I believe, was Jewish herself. Not to say that just because there was one Jewish actress, the film couldn't have contained anti-Semitic elements. And despite its overall dark and gory nature, I did think that the film did have some genuinely beautiful moments. One that I remember gave me chills when I saw it, and it still sticks with me. I think there was a moment where there was this juxtaposition between Christ um, stumbling and uh, struggling to carry the cross, and a flashback to Christ as a child stumbling and his mother rushing to his aid. And I just thought that was super powerful. I even, I'm getting the chills right now talking about it. And that might seem strange coming from an atheist, but uh, at the end of the day, I still at least believe in the, uh, the power of religious symbolism and the power of storytelling in general. And I was raised Catholic, so. I imagine I'm still somewhat susceptible to Catholic and Christian symbolism. So at the end of the day, I, I'm not really sure wh whether I thought that the Passion of the Christ was anti-Semitic, but I know it did come under a, a lot of fire from people who thought it was. Um, but if we had any doubt about whether or not uh, Mel Gibson is harboring anti-Semitic <laughs> tendencies, um, I don't think we did have any doubt shortly down the road from The Passion of the Christ. Cause I think it was roughly around that time that Gibson um, was arrested for a DUI, I believe. And he had been hostile to the, um, the police and hurling anti-Semitic epithets around and kind of espousing those kind of grotesque conspiracy theories about Jews running the world, etc. And this is where we kind of come to the news story. Is roughly around the time, a little after Mel Gibson got in trouble for that scandal, that he mentioned how he was working on a movie about the Maccabees. And uh, a few people have never heard that word before. It probably sounds somewhat funny. And as you know, uh, I have a tendency to get this kind of childish glee out of certain words. Last week it was Bilby, uh, which is a small Australian marsupial that was going to replace the Easter Bunny, uh, or actually is to a certain extent <laughs> um, in, in Australia. And uh, it was probably episode one or two when I had said the name of Rabbi Shmuley and talked about how I love saying Shmuley. Actually, I think it's Shmuley, but I have trouble saying that properly. And so this week, the uh, magic word of the day might be Maccabees. But even if you find that a funny word, the uh, Maccabees were actually a tough group of ancient Jewish freedom fighters. In the second century BC, Judah Maccabee was the leader who led the 
Maccabean revolt against the uh, Greek Seleucid Empire. And the celebration of Hanukkah is linked to um, Judah Maccabee and the uh, Maccabean revolt. And most of us probably know what a menorah is. It's basically a candelabra uh, type of object that uh, one candle is lit on each night of Hanukkah. And the tradition of the of lighting the menorah goes back to when the Maccabees were celebrating the rededication of the temple. They were in short supply of of ritual lamp oil, and somehow, supposedly, miraculously, the oil stretched to last for eight days. And that's where the tradition of the eight days of Hanukkah and the lighting of the menorah comes from. So anyway, it's obviously a very important Jewish story. And Gibson had talked about wanting to do a movie about the Maccabees shortly after that uh, scandal where he was um, accused of hurling some anti-Semitic epithets around. I think some people cynically, but justly, I would think, um, accuse Gibson of uh, maybe proposing the Maccabee Project as a, a way to try to make himself look less anti-Semitic in the public eye. And I, I think Gibson himself had claimed that he had been long working on the movie um, for quite some time prior to the scandal. And that brings us to current events. Joe Esterhaus was supposed to be working on a screenplay for Gibson, and I think Warner Brothers, I think. And uh, supposedly things went sour between him and Gibson. And according to Esterhaus, his uh, younger son had been secretly, I'm not sure why, <laughs> recording conversations between Esterhaus and Gibson on his iPhone. And uh, Gibson is accused of some pretty atrocious stuff. Once again, more anti-Semitic uh, epithets. And uh, you guys probably heard something about the scandal, about when things went south between Mel Gibson and his mo most recent wife. And uh, there's accusations of domestic abuse and verbal abuse. And supposedly on these recordings between Gibson and Esther Haas, there's... Um, mention of Gibson saying he wants to do some pretty horrific things to his uh, to his ex, which I won't even attempt to mention on the show because it's so graphic. Um, in fairness to Gibson, he denies all this. And uh, there was one other uh, alleged remark that I wanted to talk about because it leads into a nice little story about my own developing atheism or whatever. Um, Gibson, supposedly according to Esther Haas, and in fairness to Gibson, he refutes this, but he was accused of saying that he hated John Lennon and he was basically glad John Lennon was shot and that he was dead and he called him uh, messianic because of uh, the song Imagine. And Gibson claims that he actually likes the song Imagine and that he's a big Beatles fan. And supposedly fa um, friends of Gibson claim that if you go to his house, you are likely to hear the Beatles. So where the truth lies on that, I don't know. But anyway, it brought back memories for me. Uh, anyone out there who knows me probably knows that I'm a, I'm a Doors guy. I, I'm, I've been an avid Doors fan since I was uh, probably early middle school. Um, I've always liked the Beatles, but I've liked their more psychedelic stuff, uh, personally. And I like a lot of John Lennon's solo stuff. But I can remember growing up, and uh, this is when I was still a little Catholic child and still wrestling with that uh, developing loss of God and faith. And I used to find the song Imagine very disturbing. Um, as you can imagine, for a child with a, a fragile psyche and who's trying to hold on some kind of belief in God 
when you hear a song that talks about imagine there's no religion, imagine there's no heaven, it was kind of disturbing stuff. And I think I may have even on some level kind of resented John Lennon for writing the song and kind of thinking, why would someone write a song like this, you know? Um, but of course now, as a, a grown man and as a non-believer myself and as a songwriter, I appreciate the lyrics and uh it's still not one of my favorite uh john lennon songs um i still kind of prefer instant karma and uh a lot of his um beatles stuff but i guess uh in a weird way let's say if gibson really did say that kind of ugly stuff about john lennon i think in some way i can relate to why religious people resent that song because it just basically it, it point blank uh, challenges your belief in God and heaven, or at least asks you to temporarily do so. And uh, I have the odd theory, and, and that maybe it's presumptuous of me and can't really be proved. But on some level, I think everyone doubts to some degree, and, and I guess that's uh, why they call it faith in a sense. <laughs> Uh, I often talk about how, you know, no sensible atheist would claim to know 100% whether or not there was a God or to be able to prove 100% whether or not there was a God. And I think maybe sensible religious people are the same where they say it's a matter of faith and if pushed, they couldn't prove 100% whether there was uh, a God or not. So I think it's kind of human nature where people don't want to have their core beliefs challenged. And if there's a belief that's at the center of their being and gives purpose to their lives and you challenge that, it's instinctual to maybe get defensive or uh, resentful. Um, so I think I can probably uh, empathize or sy sympathize with religious people who have a, a problem with that song. Um but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm probably simpatico with John Lennon's religious beliefs and his uh, sentiments posed in that song. But it's funny that maybe I still have a little bit of a sour taste in my mouth because I can remember being a, um, a young religious kid and, and being kind of disturbed by the song and its subject matter. But well, long live the memory of John Lennon and one of the world's greatest uh, singers and songwriters, probably uh, thinkers and activists, too. Anyway, now I think it's time to move on to the main body of the show. So let's get on to the subject of atheism and the transcendent. Last week I did an episode on atheism and morality. And it was basically just me exploring the possible origins of morality and asking the question whether or not you needed religion in order to be a moral being or to draw morality from. And if you listen to that episode, then you probably know that I came down the side that, uh, like Christopher Hitchens, I believe that we don't get our morality from religion, that religion gets its morality from us, basically. And I gave some examples of proto-ethics and uh, examples of morality in the animal world. And I consider this episode, Atheism and the Transcendent, to be kind of a follow-up to that one. Um, I think they go together because I think two of the most important aspects of being human are our moral code, and our sense of spirituality. And that's pretty much what I mean by the transcendent. I'm using it as a synonym for the quote-unquote spiritual. Christopher Hitchens used to like to use the, the synonym numinous. Uh, it is a pretty cool word. Uh, but the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines numinous as... Um, an adjective meaning supernatural, mysterious, filled with a sense of presence of divinity, holy, appealing to the higher emotions or to the aesthetic sense, spiritual. And I think whether or not you believe in God, um, 
all of us have had those experiences where maybe you feel um, plugged into something larger than yourself or you feel moved, a feeling that you've transcended normal consciousness. Um, it could be something as simple as the sense of oneness someone might get from meditation or the whole sense of euphoria or spiritual ecstasy you get if you're looking out your window on a um, sunny day and you feel like your uh, ego is slipping away and you feel yourself becoming one with the vibrant colors of the flowers and the leaves stirring in the breeze and you just lose yourself in the moment. Could be being moved by art, by music, um, or like I just alluded to, just being moved by your surroundings and the, um, the power of landscape, the right lighting, the right time of day, uh, that sort of thing. And of course, uh, <laughs> similar, uh, possibly much more potent experiences can be induced by ingesting uh, psychoactive or psychedelic drugs, uh, psilocybin mushrooms, uh, lysergic acid, uh, that type of thing. Um, those experiences can be pretty powerful and uh, I de definitely suggest extreme caution. <laughs> before going down that road. Uh, things like meditation and music and uh, getting lost in the beauty of nature are probably a much safer bet. I can remember even as a little kid, I was nervous. Uh, I tend to live a lot inside my own head. Uh, it was as if I always needed something to worry about. And then every once in a while... I would just have these um, experiences where it was as if the metaphorical clouds parted and all of a sudden everything fell away and I became aware of uh, the beauty of nature around me, uh, just moved by the sight of the sky, by the vegetation around me, by, um, by just a kind of ineffable uh, feeling of uh, oneness. Um, it's a feeling that's very hard to put into words. And I remember as a kid, I would love those brief moments and I would uh, wistfully kind of pine away that they didn't uh, occur more and they were kind of few and far in between. I don't think it was probably until uh, my late teens, early 20s, when I started to develop a interest in Eastern religion and um, where I kind of saw the uh, religious or philosophical or spiritual precedents for those hard to describe moments. Um, of course, in Eastern religion, we have an emphasis on meditation, which is all about trying to dissolve the ego, trying to um, enter a simple state as possible. A lot of times you'll focus on just your own breathing and try to clear away all thoughts. Uh, and even in Buddhism, uh, you know, the goal is to try to attain nirvana, the extinguishing of the ego or the self, uh, where, where you become one with everything. Um, and there's also some parallels, even in uh, Christian mysticism, you can find stuff like that. And even though I don't believe in the supernatural beliefs of Eastern religion any more than those of Western religion, that, that emphasis on trying to be simple and enjoy the present, uh, that's something that I've always kept with me. And uh, obviously entering a state like that uh, can be easier said than done. Um, probably safe to say all of us have a certain amount of stress and uh, <laughs> havoc we have to deal with on a regular basis. But um, I'm happy to say that I probably have something like one of those moments at least once or twice every, every day. 
And I don't know what's made it so much easier to reproduce them or to experience them if it was all that reading into Eastern religion or um, just becoming more aware of the concept or uh, maybe just maturing and getting older and realizing that constantly worrying about things, you know, isn't uh, and overcomplicating things isn't going to do me any good. And it's just nice to allow yourself to just enjoy the present as is here and there. So it might be times when I get up extra early and it seems like I'm the only one who's awake. It's just me in the world and maybe I get that feeling. Um, well, like I said, it could be on just a particularly nice day where just looking out your window or stepping outside, you're just moved by the, the beauty of the world around you. Um, and I think people have a tendency to attribute those type of feelings or experiences to God. Maybe some people might think it's the Holy Spirit moving through them, or it's uh, literally your spirit becoming one um, with some kind of cosmic consciousness or some kind of universal energy or universal presence, something like that. Being a, a skeptic and non-believer, I tend to believe the roots are probably neurological or biological, uh, all upstairs in the brain, just like I believe consciousness is basically generated by the brain. Um, but that shouldn't invalidate those experiences. I think no matter where they come from, uh, those experiences are still real and they're still very valid. I think they're something that we should uh, cherish and try to experience more in life. But I remember uh, the, the fact that I did have those quote-unquote spiritual experiences and the, and the fact that I am a kind of... Uh, sensitive, emotional, artistic person, tend to get moved easily a lot by uh, music and art, by um, these sudden uh, bouts of inspiration where an idea, a creative idea will suddenly come to me. And it was hard for me to reconcile that side of me with my lack of belief. And I think that was probably one of the last stumbling blocks between me and... Uh, atheism or being comfortable considering myself an atheist or a non-believer because I was always like well where do these experiences come from these romantic spiritual inspirational moving experiences if there is no God or whatever and I always pictured that uh, someone who considered themselves uh, an atheist would uh, probably be too smug or too uh, skeptical to allow themselves to indulge those type of experiences or value them. And I was very wrong with that. And it, it wasn't until I started reading the works of Christopher Hitchens, um, Sam Harris, um, Richard Dawkins, I realized all these prominent atheists, you know, those kind of atheist boogeymen that uh, um, devoutly religious people kind of probably fear or resent on some level. These are people that all value the transcendent or the numinous. And I believe uh, Sam Harris, uh, other than being an author and prominent atheist, I think he's also a neuroscientist, I believe. And he's uh, done a lot of research into meditation and uh, different states of consciousness. And uh, any of you have seen that two-part series I may have mentioned before, The Four Horsemen, which you can find on YouTube, which is a, a sit-down discussion with Dennett, Harris, Hitchens, and Dawkins. They actually do a significant amount of talking about uh, the numinous or the transcendent and uh, how valid it is. And uh, So I'd say that if you're an atheist or feel yourself being lured towards that worldview, don't worry that atheism means uh, giving up uh, morality and spirituality. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. I remember I was watching this one documentary. Uh, I'm trying to think if it, if it was on 
altered states of consciousness uh, had to do with maybe uh, psychedelic drugs and shamanism and that kind of thing. But anyway, it, they there's this one portion that always stuck with me where they're showing a, a chimpanzee basically standing erect. And by erect, I mean uh, up on two feet get your mind out of the gutter and uh the almost in a parody of a, a bipedal human stance you know and he was staring up at a waterfall that kind of had like a rainbow crossing through it and it was almost as if the uh the chimp was in some kind of trance just staring and they were talking about how this might be one example of um how even our primate cousins um, have these moments of primal awe or experience uh, what we might call the transcendent and that maybe the, it is some kind of um, there are some kind of evolutionary roots in us for why we have those experiences so I think I've reached a point in my life where even though I'm not a believer and I think um, kind of cynically you might say that morality and uh, the transcendent or transcendent experiences have their roots in the brain and can be explained by neuroscience instead of a higher power. I still thoroughly enjoy those experiences and relish them. You know, it's uh, whether I suddenly get the idea for a poem or a song or a piece of music sends the chills up my spine or I look outside and see the branches stirring in the breeze. Um, I'm comfortable with the fact that it might all that might not come from a higher power, but I still just ride the wave and enjoy it. And I think while we're alive, we should try to have uh, as much of that type of thing in our lives as uh, we can. Oh, and there were a couple other things I wanted to mention, uh, little scientific tidbits on the subject of uh, the transcendent or of the feeling of some kind of uh, presence or higher power. One is, uh, I know there were, not that long ago, scientific studies uh, done by um, a scientist who used this thing called a god helmet. And basically, he'd put this god helmet on a college student's head uh, with their consent, uh, I imagine, <laughs> inside a, dar a darkened room. And supposedly, he was able to reproduce the sensation that um, there was another presence in the room, uh, something akin to... You know, feeling uh, the presence of God or something like that, hence the name God Helmet. I think that's one of those things that points to the idea that the feeling of a, another presence or what we might call a transcendent actually has its origins in the brain and uh, under certain conditions we can even induce such an experience. And another interesting thing, I think it was in Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. It's weird when you read the different books, they start to kind of blend together in your memory. But uh, he had a chapter, and I think he named it Binker, B-I-N-K-E-R. It's actually uh, the name of uh, an old children's poem. The chapter in The God Delusion is about the phenomenon of imaginary friends um, and children and how there might be some kind of neurological explanation for the phenomenon of the imaginary friend or feeling as if there is a, another presence in the room and uh, it could have something to do with you know the kind of transcendent experiences that we experience not just as children, but through our, our lives. Um, I think it's the opening to Binker and kind of gives you a, a feeling what Dawkins was getting at. And it, it's kind of cool, but kind of creepy too. Um, it goes, Binker, what I call him, is a secret of my own, and Binker is the reason why I never feel alone. Playing in the nursery, sitting on the stair, 
whatever I am busy at, Binker will be there. And now you can see what I mean. It's a little creepy. Uh, it kind of conjures up that feeling that there's another presence on uh, in the room and it's always with you. Uh, and so once again, Dawkins was kind of drawing a correlation between the imaginary friend and the kind of transcendental uh, experience of, of feeling that there's an additional presence or that you're plugged into something larger, some kind of a communion with, with the other. Um, so I just think that's interesting stuff. Food for thought, at least. Uh, and I think that about does it for this episode. Uh, so I want to thank everyone for listening yet again. Um, and also... Please don't forget to like us on Facebook. If you haven't already, you can just go to Facebook and look for The Week in Doubt. Or you can give us a review or a listen on Podbean. And, uh, or also, you can also subscribe and uh, give us a review via iTunes. All right, thank you. 